Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bolbaka and I'm coming at you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And what I have for you today is a discussion around the newly published and the newly revived topic, let's say, around use cases and their connection with user stories and other techniques that we are using today. This was prompted by um, a post uh, by Alistair Coburn, a post on Twitter that says, Dear people about use cases, Ivar Jacobson, the inventor of use cases and co-creator of component-based development, UML and Roop, and Alistair Coburn, author of a popular book on use cases and also co-author of the Agile Manifesto, got together to unify, simplify, and clarify the definition of a use case so that it is easier for people to learn, to write, and to integrate with other currently popular techniques and approaches. The same document is posted in both Ivar's and Alistair home site. We hope you find this unified foundation for use cases useful. Watch for more posts and discussions on this topic soon. Why this, you ask? We see projects suffering because the stakeholders are missing the big picture and PO suffering because user stories have big holes that cost the sponsor lots of money as they pop up. Even the lightest use cases fix both of those. That's why more to come. All right. And they posted uh, a document, uh, a four page document. So. Excellent, very short, very brief. That details what they mean by use cases. But before we go there, what I'd like to do is to go back a little bit in history and discuss what use cases are and kind of where they came from. So initially, as you can see here on the Wikipedia article, um, in 1987, Ivar Jacobson presented the first article on use cases at the Oops Light E7 conference. So this was initially created as a technique for object-oriented design. Oopsla basically is an object-oriented programming and something else I don't remember exactly but it was a conference around object-oriented design and a conference where many things many innovations that we are using today and that don't look anymore like <laughs> new things um, have been created part of it was uh, for example design patterns or designer tubes or discussed at Hoopsla. So what you have to know is that around that time there were various groups trying to integrate this new type of design, this new idea. Uh, Object-oriented programming changed fundamentally the way people were writing code uh, and the industry was coming after a crisis. Uh, the crisis was that programs grew bigger and bigger and the techniques that people were using in developing software back then in languages like Fortran, Cobol, um, and in other languages that were structured rather than uh, and procedural rather than object-oriented. Um, when the program got bigger and bigger, it was... Uh, more and more difficult to deal with complexity. And this is where things like uh, the paper on go to consider harmful came from. This is where uh, these articles, these various techniques around object oriented programming came from design patterns. So it was a very fruitful period in terms of innovation and in terms of Ex experimenting with different things. It was back then that small talk was created and used and it, it brought a lot of innovation, a lot of different things um, 
that I hope I will discuss a little bit more in the future. I plan to go back to the way object-oriented programming was supposed to be and how messaging was supposed to be a big part of it. Uh, and how this changed with the few languages that came after with C++ and then Java. Um, it completely changed the paradigm. So, and basically the idea was how to get more and more complex software and how to model um, and take this complexity, divide and conquer, and end up with an architecture and then end up with uh, a design uh, based on objects. And in this period of with a lot of innovation, part of it was around managing and figuring out how to deal with complex requirements. Um, and this is when use cases came up. And Ivory Jacobson, so he was working at Ericsson. And as you can, we can read on Wikipedia, he described how use cases were used at Ericsson to capture and specify requirements of a system using textual, structural, and visual model modeling techniques to drive object-oriented analysis and design. Um, in 1992, he co-authored the book Object-Oriented Software Engineering, a use case driven approach. And this is a seminal book in uh, object-oriented uh, design, which laid the foundation of the OOSC system engineering method and helped to popularize use cases for capturing functional requirements, especially in software development. In 1994, he published a book about use cases and object-oriented techniques applied to business models and business process re-engineering. And perhaps this is something that you, you don't realize, but back then, objects were such a big thing that people are thinking how to use objects in various places. As you can see, uh, use cases and object-oriented techniques applied to business models and business process re-engineering. So even to kind of business management and structure. Um, and also if you search some of the videos from Apple back then, Steve Jobs was very big on objects. Oh, well, I think he was at Next at that point in time. Uh, and one of the big sell points uh, and things that he stresses about Next is that it's object-oriented. <laughs> so it's very easy to underestimate how big this transformation was. It doesn't look that interesting today for us programmers because we have classes, we have objects in oral languages and we just use them. And many of the things that back then were innovations now are common features in languages. So it's is very difficult to understand the, the context. But basically, this is what happened. And, and then here's what the interesting part came, because in parallel with this, you had a bunch of people trying to create visual notations for design, because they got inspired from industrial design or other design disciplines where you would draw and you'd have a visual language, right? And there were a bunch of visual languages created um, and that, that different people were using. So Grady Butch and James Rambo worked at unifying their object analysis and design methods the Butch method and object modeling technique, respectively. 
1995, Ivar Jacobson joined them and together they created UML, the Unified Modeling Language, which includes use case modeling. UML was standardized by the Object Management Group in 1997. Jacobson, Butch and Rambo also worked on a refinement of the objectory software development process. The resulting Unify process was published in 1999 and promoted the use case driven approach. So basically, um, if I remember correctly, Jacobson went on with Rational Unify process with Roop um, and UML went on its own track. Uh, and Roop was basically a methodology that could have been quite lightweight, but in reality it was implemented, at least most in the cases where I've seen it, it was very heavyweight. And so the interesting thing is that as a reaction to all these things, it was imagine you were, uh, you had to create, you were working on a product, right? On a software product. And before you could do anything, you would have to write a bunch of documents. Back then, there was also this idea of doing analysis first. So you'd get the whole product, analyze everything first, which meant split everything into use cases, um, document the use cases in um, SRE documents, so S SRS, so Software Requirement Specification document and then you would have this full document with specifications that you would give to architects and architects would take this and uh, draw some UML diagrams that describe the architecture and typically the first ones were actors, use cases and then for each use case you could go in and do a bunch of diagrams like um, some of them were sequence diagrams, uh, you might have a deployment diagram, and so on. You could have a, a bunch of diagrams all the way down to class diagrams. And then the whole idea was that you would do this and you would have the, Ideally, you'd have software that takes the these diagrams, generates classes, and programmers just come in and kind of write the implementation in each method of each class, and things just work. Unfortunately, uh, this was very naive, right? Unless the domain model is very stable, and the um, and very well understood so that you can actually make this analysis um, most of the time software re requirements change while you are trying to develop them because the market changes around you and um, some of the assumptions that you made when doing the analysis and the, the architecture don't actually fit with the reality. But um, if you go and try to understand in detail what rational unified process was, it, it was meant to be a more like an iterative kind of process, one where you would um, iterate through all these things and work on smaller pieces and figure out. So it it was supposed to be closer to Agile than most people saw in practice. Um, but anyway, you had this and as a reaction to all these heavyweight processes, um, a bunch of programmers basically revolted and said, okay, so we're going to try something different. How about we take, we look at the big problem 
and then we figure out which is the smallest problem that we can fix now or the most important one and then we figure out which is the smallest part of this problem that we can solve in two weeks or three weeks or initially it was a month but then it got uh, smaller and we're just gonna go and implement this and repeat this again and again but in order to do this in a way that works nicely and in order to preserve our speed and maybe even to increase it what we need to do is to follow a bunch of technical practices like that are quite extreme so this is why we're going to call this extreme programming and this is how you got extreme programming and then scrum um, so and part of this was okay but we still need a way we still need somebody to give us requirements and because we don't want as programming team we don't want to concern ourselves with that so that um we don't know who that person is so we'll call them product owner it doesn't matter who they are but what they have to do is uh, come every now and then when we finish things and tell us okay this is the next thing that you need to work on and these are kind of the details and we can ask them and have a conversation and it turned out that it was easier to do this by using a format um, introduced in a company called Conextra where we would say uh, we have a, a story right one of the one of our users would like to solve this problem um, in this way for this reason and we always need to ask okay which type of user and what they need solved and why so how about we put this into a format and we say as a as a online buyer i want to add products to cards so that i can buy them and this is how you end up with user stories but part of the part of the inspiration for user stories were use cases because if you look at what use cases are they are basically user type or persona and what they need to do and why which brings us to the present moment when Ivor and Alistair tell us that you know maybe maybe stakeholders are missing the big pictures and POs are suffering product owners are suffering because user stories have big holes that cost the sponsors lots of money as they pop up even the lightest use case cases fix both of those all right so now let's look at what they want to want us to do with user use cases and honestly i i think use cases are quite good whenever i teach software architecture courses the first thing i want to do is to have a use case diagram to have actors although i would prefer that our actors are actually personas and they describe in more detail a type of user but as basically a slice of demography in our users a representative an abstraction for a um for a group of users and i would prefer that even though maybe you have multiple such personas per role it's still nice to have this let me give you an example i worked on um, medical applications for gps and um, 
we had personas uh, because in one case we would have, let's say, a persona which was a, an older doctor, lots of experience, but who is not as used to the technology, doesn't actually like technology. And at the other end, we had more personas, but these are two that I kind of contrasting. At the other end, you would have a young doctor just out of university who lives on the mobile phone and knows how to use technology, but also, you know, needs to do the same things as this, the older doctor. So, and it's interesting to think about this when you model your software because, okay, part of it is user interface and UX and all that. But then based on this, you might also make decisions in terms of design. Uh, some features might be specifically for a certain persona. And I think this is useful to show in use cases. But whether you have actors or personas, it's interesting to then see the diagram with the use cases because this gives us an overview of the system. And these are diagrams that you can and probably should maintain because the problem with um, user stories and particularly if you're using uh, software, digital software tools like Jira is that these tools are meant for the transient stories, the transient tasks. They are just meant to manage your work. So you would create the user story, you take it through the different steps, implement it, put it in production, and then you should be able to delete it. But I need to have a way to understand and to have a map of the current application. And I still don't know any better one than the use case diagram from, um, from UML. And currently I think it's quite interesting if you combine this with, uh, so architecture diagrams as code, uh, technologies like plant UML or structurizer or, uh, I think Mermaid is another one where you would write some markup and it creates the diagrams for you because this markup you can have in your um, repository, in your source code repository, and then you can adapt it and improve it incrementally as you add new features to the system. So it's quite useful to have these diagrams and particularly if you have them in uh, these tools, it then is just a matter of keeping things up to date whenever new features are added. So let's look at um, this. Now, Ivor Jacobson is doing another uh, initiative which is trying to unify various aspects of software development. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting. Maybe I'll do a video on it in the future. But it's basically taking various aspects of software development and trying to put together sets of best practices along with visual notations, along with you know, things that you can use and kind of pick and choose um, depending on your context. And I'm pretty sure that this use case foundation is part of that. And I'm really curious what they do with it next. So use case foundation, a document by Ivor Jacobson and Alistair Coburn. To get to the heart of what the system must do, focus on who or what will use it, and then look at what the system must do for them to help them achieve their goals. A use case is all the ways of using a system to achieve a goal of a particular user. So already there is a slightly different focus from a user story. A user story will just take 
uh, the goal and how uh, you do it um, using a specific product and what type of user which will be common. But I think this is interesting because this shows all the ways of using a system to achieve a goal of a particular user. All right. So let's see. Core concepts. There is a system of interest, a primary actor with a goal, a flow of events, there will be several, a use case to collect those flows. So basically what you have is an actor, a use case, another actor. A use case is all the ways of using a system to achieve a goal of a particular user. Notes, this includes all the successful, challenged and failure paths. It may be described textually or visually, it is independent of implementation technology and platform. So once again, these are similarities with user use cases, uh, with uh, user stories. A user story can be described, well, we usually describe it textually, but you can describe it visually if you we are using any kind of workflows. Uh, but this is the main uh, common thing. Both use cases and user stories are independent of implementation, technology, and platform. And now a user story might not include all the ch failure paths or the challenge paths because one of the things for a user story is that you may split a successful or yeah happy path from a challenged and failure path. So basically you could split a use case into multiple user stories. And I think this is how you would end up with them. The system of interest is the system used to achieve the goal an actor and you notice that this is not necessarily a software system <laughs> it's just a system so you could in theory do the apply the same thing for a business right you would have business actors which are your customers and then business use cases which are basically you know products or features that your or services that your business offers and so on but we'll stick to the software development uh, approach. An actor. Actor is intended to cover anything with behavior. It can be a person, an organization, a piece of software, or any combination. Uh, and this solves a lot of problems with user stories. So, for example, one of the challenges with user stories is when you have when you create APIs and part of the user, you know, one of the users of the API is definitely the developer who is implementing code that interacts with your API. And you should take this into account. But most of it is probably a system that works with your API and then when you come to user stories, it's a bit more difficult to describe this because ideally a user story is about a slice that goes from a real person all the way down uh, to the system. And this works really well for smaller products, smaller applications, or, well, when you have real cross-functional teams that cover everything. But for larger organizations, you would end up often splitting kind of upstream applications with backend, you know, APIs or other things like that. And in that case, it starts getting a bit more weird to use user stories. And uh, it makes more sense, well, we extend anyway to system actors for user stories as well, but it doesn't have the same the same sound to it, right? As a, 
as a web application, I need to call the database so that I can get data from it. <laughs> it's not as nice as with real people. And this is where maybe use cases might work better. An actor identifies a role played when interacting with the system. A use case might involve many actors. The actor that initiates a use case is known as the primary actor. And the actors called upon by the system are known as supporting actors. This is quite nice, once again. Once again, with user stories, sometimes it's difficult to express this. Um, you have to simplify it a lot. And that's the power of user stories, because they they force you to go to things that are simpler. But at the same time, uh, they may they may not give you the full information about the system, and sometimes you need this. The goal, the reason that the user will use the system and the value that they will receive when successfully using the system. And this is similar to what we have in user stories, although we will see that they are different. A simple example, so, and we have a primary actor that is a shopper uh, who thinks I'd like to get a new guitar. There is a system of interest, he goes there and the use case is browse and shop. And then you have three supporting actors, stock control, sales advisor, and payment system. So primary actor, in this case, a shopper with the goal of selecting and purchasing a product. The system of interest, in this case, an online portal providing advice on all things musical. One of the system's use cases is browse and shop. And supporting actors, other actors that can be involved in the successful completion of the use case. This can be other systems or other people. In this case, the system of interest needs to interact with a stock control system, a payment system, and for specialist high value products, a sales advisor. Okay, so interesting diagram, right? And it shows you how you can express quite nicely parts of your features, right? Even if I have user stories, this representation is helpful because it's a very small diagram, um, but it packs a, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and it's very, very useful once you know, and it's very easy to read. Unlike the other, well, some of the other 70, 80 UML diagrams, this is very easy to read. Underlying principles. Use cases apply to systems of all types and sizes, businesses, IT systems, physical systems, or any combination thereof. Use cases help you understand the big picture, the system's purpose, and how it will be used. Use cases focus on value the user's goal and how best to achieve them. Stakeholder involvement is essential. Bring all the involved parties together to establish the intent and scope of the system. A use case tells the whole story as a story from the initial event to the realization of the value it provides or the eventual failure if it can be met. It includes how to handle any problems and alternatives that may occur on the way. And this is this is very nice, um, because often when we start, I mean, it's a natural way of thinking about feature, even if what you end up implementing is a very small slice of this, which is a user story, it's still useful to have the big picture, uh, and that's a use case, right? Use cases trigger conversations while discussing the possible alternate flows. You and your co-writers will think of missing steps and missing alternatives. These conversations help you find situations that often get overlooked. Prioritize readability. The goal is to communicate the big picture to everyone involved, generating comments, spotting any gaps, and getting their buy-in. The amount of detail and the format used will vary to match your circumstances. You can start with a sketch of the flow of events and that detail as needed. 
A use case can be implemented in stages, develop and put in place some key flows of a use case early to capture value and feedback, add less used or less critical flows over time strategically. And I think this, the ninth point, the last one that I've read, this shows you how you can uh, marry uh, use cases with user stories, right? You start by devising the use case and then you would say, okay, so we'll just do this part. And this is our user story. And you don't have to go with the use case in all the possible detail because you can always add detail later. But add just the most important, the core things, then split into user stories and then you can come back to use cases and say, oh, so we actually have some more alternative situations and so on. Because the big the big issue with use cases is that you can go overboard, you can overanalyze stuff. But remember that if you are doing any kind of a agility related um, work, what you should focus on is to, to do a just-in-time specification just in time requirements, which means, okay, so we have this big requirement. First, maybe we can figure out which is the most important part of it, and then draw the most important part of that as a use case, and then look at that and see, okay, so what's the first user story that we can implement? And I think that's a very cl clear way of working and the natural way of working, right? Now, if you can do this without use cases, perfect, no worries. <laughs> I'm not saying that everybody has to use use cases, I'm just saying that they, they can work together really well. Okay. And then we have a sample use case. The use case is presented as a network of flows, each describing a path to value. So we have basic flow, step one, step two, step three, step n, then the use case sends, alternate flow, alt one, alt two, alt three, alt n. The basic flow is the normal happy path to value, often referred to as the main scenario of the happy path. This is described as a simple sequence of steps, each of which involves the system and or one of the actors doing something. Alternate flow, a list of all the special cases, alternative path, optional steps, and errors that need to be handled. The key aspects of a use case is its structure, the way it identifies the basic and alternate flows. This acts as a map of how the system will be used. The flow of events can be described as simply as a bullet list of steps and alternatives or elaborated to fully describe what should happen at each step or within each alternative. It can be described in text as above or in some graphical form. What is important is the accuracy of the flow of events or not how detailed you write out the steps and alternatives. A simple example. So you have primary actor shopper, there is a goal, help the shopper to find the most suitable product to meet their needs and help them to purchase it. And then you have a basic flow. The use case starts when the shopper indicates they'd like to find the product. The steps, one, browse products, two, select products for purchase, three, provide payment details, four, provide delivery details, five, confirm purchase. The use case sends alternative flow. And here there are many examples, but some of them QR search for products, invalid payment details, product out of stock, quit shopping with no purchase, and so on. Now, it's interesting that this flow actually reminds me of um, user story mapping, uh, because you could represent, if I would do a user story map, I would probably end up with the same steps and then maybe with some alternate uh, flows. And basically this is what you have. So this tells me that actually user story maps and use cases kind of work quite well together. Note, if you look closely, you might find issues and problems mixing steps and missing alternatives with this use case. This is deliberate. This is exactly the sort of conversation that we want the use case to start.
And this is the end of the document. So it's a four page document. It describes pretty nicely a lot of uh, the things with uh, use cases. But then um, uh, Alistair Coburn felt the need to, I guess, after the feedback, uh, to give some more examples. Uh, and he tweeted a bit later, what does the use case looks like? I hear you ask. Here are three to give you an idea. They are meet flight, hence show the thinking and conversations that go on while they are being investigated. You can use use stories if you use our stories if you like, but the business is kept in the use cases. Interesting. Um, Interesting way of putting it. And okay, so we have a use case, record the meter reading plus visit status. Uh, I'm okay, it doesn't tell us uh, what it's about, but my feeling is about uh, reading like the electricity meters, for example, or the gas or water meters. Um, and then we have a system, the handheld plus the backend system, primary actor agent. Main success scenario, agent goes to the service point and records the meter reading on his handheld device. And then it's interesting that questions are embedded in this uh, description. Does he use a web interface to the main system or a separate app on the handheld? Two, the system transfers the data if the handheld is connected to the internet. This reminds me of the old days when you would have devices that sometimes had internet connections, but um, not always. So basically you would store data on them and occasionally stream them to, <laughs> to the server. Extensions, 1A, the agent can get to the meter to read it, and then question mark, what does it do here? <laughs> 2A, the system is not connected, and then question marks, when does the reading get transferred? So these are interesting, because uh, I think they bring more clarity, and once you have this type of description, it's quite easy to extract the user stories from my perspective. Okay, let's see the second example is generate bills, primary actor, financial manager. Main success scenario, the financial manager has the system retrieve and present all the customers with today's billing date. Two, the system presents all those customers, including the last meter reading, the calculated consumption from the last readings, the proposed tariff and the proposed billing amount. Three, the financial manager tells the system to produce the bills. Four, the system produces the bills. The bills contain billing amount, installments, and deductions. Extensions, 2A, no reading was entered for a customer. And then the system calculates an amount. For example, it just repeats the bill amount from the previous month, but bill might be changed to an average of several preceding months, or it reads a fixed amount from a table. Now we have to investigate who wrote the table and where it resides. <laughs> To be future release, the uh, financial manager can override the reading or tariff if needed. The system updates all the calculated quantities. And then you have a third one, which is collect a payment, primary actor agent. Main success scenario one, agent visits the subscriber service point unit and marks his presence. Two, system presents the bill details, billing amount. Three, agent collects the payment from subscriber. Four agent marks whether the payment was made in cash or credit card. Five, system generates and prints a payment receipt indicating subscriber info, service point info, payment info, extensions to a more than one bill at a time. To be deductions are made on subscriber's account, deduction amount will exist in the bill. To see an installment plan is added to the subscriber, installment monthly amount will exist in the bill. So I find this quite interesting because based on those, I, I can see how they bring a lot of clarity. And I would definitely go for a diagram, even though the diagram, the use case diagrams tend to be very simple, 
but I think this is what I like about them. They are quite basic, easy to read. Um, very, very simple. It's You don't have a lot of elements. They just show you the important parts and leave you alone. So it's really good. And if you have this textual description as well, I would almost have it in, in the... underneath the diagram and and then based on this i can definitely see how i can extract uh, a user story because in this case my first user story would be let's assume that the handheld is connected to the internet or maybe just you know the the, the simplest user story would be as an agent, I want to record the meter reading on my handheld device. And that's it. And we implement this. And then the next part will be, let's assume that the handheld is always connected to the internet and transfer the data. Let's check that the data is transferred. And then let's, let's do other stuff. Like what happens if it's not connected when uh, when do you make the transfer, which will probably be later, and so on. But at the same time, this gives me enough information for architecture, because what this tells me is that I might not be connected to the internet, which means I need a sort of a database on the handheld device and a sort of a synchronization mechanism with the server. So I cannot count on the fact that I will have 100% connection, I just need to stream from time to time to, to the server some data. And in the second use case where you have generate bills with a financial manager, you already kind of have the steps and you could have the first user story, you know, um, would be the first step, and actually a part of the first step. Or maybe you would just start with the end. Let's assume that you can get, let's assume that you don't have a lot of customers or a lot of bills, okay? Assume you have a manageable amount of bills, and the only thing I want to do is with skip step two, we don't present the customers, I just tell the system to produce the bills and I get the right bills, right? Maybe without even seeing the customers. I just go somewhere and I, see gen I say generate bills and it just generates my bills. And this would be a first good user story because it focuses on the most important part, which is the ability to send bills. I can then look, maybe manually sort through the bills and figure out which one to send today and which ones to send later on. Not great usability, but you have uh, usefulness before usability. So it's important first for a product to be useful. And this would already be useful. Then you'd go into uh, usability, which means, for example, selecting the right things. Or another user story, another possible user story for this that you could start with is I see the list of all the customers. I can select one of them and generate the bill for for that customer. And that's it. You know, um, depending on you know what I want to do and what makes more sense in the, in the given context. But again, the, the value would be and the usefulness would be that I can actually generate the bill. Now, how easy I can do that? That's the second part. Um, and then collecting payment is another thing which would be interesting, so maybe You know, the first thing is basically we want to collect the payment. 
So I might have two user stories here, one for cash and one for credit card. And I kind of have to have the receipt, right? So then maybe I would have a use, user story for cash payment and receipt, credit card and receipt. And these are the two user stories that I implement first. So, and I can definitely see how this can bring value, particularly to people who struggle with splitting user stories. My favorite way until now, I have to say, my favorite way has been to use uh, um, user story maps to help these people, but I am now pretty convinced that using use cases might actually make things much easier because it's easy to figure out the use, well, relatively easy to figure out the use cases. And then once you have the use cases, it's relatively easy to figure out the user stories. And we can definitely find some patterns that you can use uh, for this. Anyway, that's it for today. I, I think this was a very interesting um, article and document from Alastair Coburn and Ivor Jacobson. And these two, they have a long history in software development. So it's worth at least listening to them and see what they are doing. Um, and it's useful to see how these techniques can help us. Um, and as I said, I can definitely see some advantages to using user cases. Plus, use cases can bring more clarity to architecture as well. So, definitely recommend it. Maybe try this out, experiment with it, uh, in case you are having issues with uh, user story slicing, which I know many uh, software developers do. And um, yeah, let, us, let me know what you think. So do you have issues with uh, user story slicing? Do you use user stories? Do you use use cases? Would you like to know, learn more about these topics and how they relate to architecture, software design, and so on. Let us know in the comments. We love comments. Uh, and we read them all, we answer to them. It's been a very busy week, so I couldn't uh, go to the backlog <laughs> that we still have for the channel. But I promise that we'll, we'll get back on track and re-record the older video that was not, that lost its sound after nine minutes and um, do some answer to comments and so on. Probably I'll do this next week because I have some, some more time in between uh, different courses. Thank you kindly for the view. And until next time, remember to think, design, and work smart.